Well, as you hopefully saw last time, this franchise has had a somewhat troubled relationship with portable gaming. Sure, it had one pretty good showing, but even that had issues and it wasn't even a main entry. The next attempt was canonical, but as you'll see, it still had some major problems. Welcome back to my Metal Gear Retrospective. <laughs> That's right, for this one we'll mainly be taking a look at the first canonical Metal Gear game for a handheld system, namely Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. While this may be a main entry though, it also does so many things in such a different way than usual that it's not surprising that a lot of people still think it's just a spin-off. They're absolutely wrong, but I do understand the confusion. Not that any of that necessarily matters though. No really, who actually cares how and where this all fits in if the game itself is a painfully broken mess? If the mechanics don't work, you probably won't experience the full story anyway, making its canonical status pretty damn meaningless. That's not to say that the story here isn't worth taking a look at, but before we do, you may have noticed this game's rather distinctive presentation. No, it's not entirely unique, in fact it's reminiscent of the digital graphic novel adaptation of MGS1, but it's certainly quite different from the other main entries. Now, some may have a bit of a problem with this new look, but I'm not one of them. I actually think these comic booky cutscenes are pretty cool, even if they do kinda clash with the more traditional in-game graphics. Okay, so it is a bit weird that they still use voice acting, and these drawings may not have the same detail as fully animated cutscenes, but they're still very well made. You heard that right, by the way. There is voice acting in this game. Unlike in the Acid series, they decided to ditch the speech bubbles and use actual voices instead. For the cutscenes. Yeah, for whatever reason, they still use plenty of text-only dialogue as in-game cutscenes and radio conversations do not use voice acting. Not exactly a big deal, but still feels a bit inconsistent. This is far from this game's biggest issue though, but let's just start with the story for now. Set six years after the events of Metal Gear Solid 3, this game starts off with Naked Snake, aka Big Boss, locked up in a cell. He has no idea where he is, who kidnapped him or why, but he soon gets a few answers when he's confronted by Lieutenant Cunningham from the Fox unit. It seems Cunningham is after the Philosopher's Legacy, the secret stash of cash the CIA supposedly recovered from Colonel Volgin. Apparently they only recovered half of the Legacy though, and Cunningham is convinced that Snake has to rest, or at least that he knows where it is. Although Snake denies any knowledge of any of this, Cunningham refuses to believe him. He tries to persuade him, but as Snake still claims ignorance, Cunningham eventually leaves him with a warning to reconsider his answers. This gives Snake a perfect opportunity to escape, as this is pretty much the least secure prison in all of existence. No really, the only way this place could be easier to break out of would be if they just gave Snake the key. Granted, if you couldn't get out there wouldn't really be much of a game to speak of, but that doesn't mean you have to give us a guided tour of the escape routes. I'm not kidding, that is almost exactly what they do here. You see, another soldier who's being held captive in the cell opposite Snake's apparently managed to pry open the cover for the air duct under Snake's bed. Unfortunately, he was moved from that cell before he had a chance to use it, at least that's the story they're going with here. Snake's luck doesn't stop there though, as the air duct just happens to lead to another cell that just happens to be open, and to top it off, there are no guards in sight. In addition, this open cell also contains a new sneaking suit and a weapon for Snake to pick up, because why the hell not? Seriously, why don't you just have the villain spontaneously combust while you're at it? In any case, it turns out that the helpful prisoner in the opposite cell isn't just anyone. He is a bit younger than usual, but fans of the series should still recognize his name. The name's Campbell. Roy Campbell. Yup, this is the same man who would eventually become Solid Snake's commander. As helpful as he may or may not be here though, I have to say that this role might as well have been filled by some random soldier. What I mean is that him being Campbell really doesn't add much. Sure, it's neat to get a bit more background on this character and all, but it just feels a bit unnecessary. Either way, Roy reveals that he and Snake are being held in a missile base located on the San Hieronimo Peninsula off the coast of central Colombia. Originally under control of the Russian Red Army, the base was believed to be abandoned, but when the US received intelligence that construction had resumed, Roy's unit was sent in to investigate when they ambushed them. They, the Fox unit. My team was wiped out in the blink of an eye. I fear I'm the only survivor. What's the Fox unit doing in a Soviet base? Not a clue. Well, I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. They're probably just on vacation or something. I mean, what else could it be? Okay, so you probably have at least a rough idea of what's going on, but we do have to wait a bit for the full details. As for now, Snake attempts to free Campbell, but his cell is locked with a special key. As such, Snake is instructed to make his way to a communications tower in an attempt to make a rescue call to the US. He'll have to use an encrypted line, but luckily, Snake knows who to call. Before he can do that though, he has to get out of the prison camp, which leads us into our first real bit of gameplay. 
This is basically where we introduce the various controls and mechanics of the game, and although they may be relatively standard and decent in theory, the execution leaves a hell of a lot to be desired. In essence, the problems here can be summed up with three words. One analog stick. Yeah, as this game is only on the PSP, we don't get two analog sticks, only one. Now, there are ways to work around this limitation as proven by certain PSP titles, but they didn't even try with this one. Fair enough, moving around isn't too difficult, and although it's fairly clunky, aiming and firing works decently as well, but even with those things, there are some serious issues. For example, you actually have to press an extra button just to walk slowly, as the PSP's analog stick is too shitty to support gradual movement speed. Not a big problem, no, but certainly less than ideal. The biggest issue with these controls though is, you guessed it, the camera. I still have no earthly idea what in the name of Beelzebub's penis the donkey nuggets who made this thing were thinking, but instead of going back to just using a fixed camera like in several of the previous games, they decided to stick with a fully manual 3D camera on a system with only one analog stick. I wish I was fucking kidding. I mean, did they really not see what a monumentally idiotic idea this was? The PSP simply wasn't designed for a dual analog type setup, as it doesn't have dual analogs. How the stinking bollocks do you miss something that fucking essential? And before you even begin to suggest it, no. They don't really make up for the missing stick with any sort of half decent option. You do get a few different configurations, yes, but they all suck rhino turds. You basically have to twist your fingers around in all sorts of awkward and uncomfortable positions no matter what, at least if you want to properly control the game. With the default controls, for example, you basically can't move and control the camera at the same time. You see, the joystick controls your movement, and the D-pad, which is pretty much right above the joystick, controls the camera. You could change this so the face buttons control the camera, but then you won't be able to fire weapons while moving, as the D-pad now handles shooting. You do have more options than these, but there is pretty much no configuration you could possibly choose that even comes close to being comfortable and or intuitive, and this most definitely impacts the overall experience. There are so many times when you will be spotted or otherwise fuck up because you can't properly orient the camera, and it's just so unnecessarily dumb and clunky. The problems with the game certainly don't end there either, but we'll get to that in a bit. For now, Snake makes his way to the communications tower, where he contacts Paramedic. She informs Snake that no one will be coming to help him, as he has apparently been charged with treason, and Major Zero has been arrested under the same accusations. It seems the Fox unit that captured Snake also stole a top secret weapon from the US military, and Major Zero and Snake are believed to be the ones in charge of this revolt. Fox has also managed to recruit the remaining Soviet soldiers on the peninsula to their cause, and they're apparently planning to build their own independent nation using this new weapon and their base as leverage. This all means that Snake will not be receiving any backup, and if he doesn't do something about these rebels, he will have both them and the Pentagon on his ass. He doesn't necessarily have to do all of this on his own though, as Sigin suggests he might be able to win over some of the opposing forces to his side, bringing us to this game's big new feature, the Comrade System. Yep, for the first time in the series, you now can and have to recruit enemy soldiers to help you out. This is a pretty cool idea, and it does make a certain amount of sense, but they really didn't make this work. At all! No, really, this system may not be completely broken, but it's not far off. Basically, you first have to knock out or tranquilize any enemy you want to recruit, and then you have to drag them all the way back to your truck at the starting point of the level. This does work, and it may not seem that bad, but it's just such a slow, tedious process, and it gets really annoying really quickly. Okay, so there is an optional way to recruit soldiers, which is a tad more convenient, but it's just as annoying in its own way. You see, throughout the levels there are these hiding spaces where inactive players can lie in wait. If you drag an unconscious enemy to one of these spaces and call a specific frequency, the character hiding there will automatically do the rest. Again, this method is definitely a bit better, especially since this also allows you to capture multiple enemies at once, but it's still pretty damn time consuming and it's fiddly as all hell. The actual hiding places are just way too stingy and far apart, and if you place the enemies even a hair too far in any direction, your teammates refuse to take care of them for you. Your teammates aren't just AI characters either, by the way. Any enemy you recruit can be used instead of Snake, as the levels use sort of a squad system. In essence, you control one operative at a time, and switch between them as you see fit. This is neat enough, I guess, but it does feel a bit odd to spend most of your time in a Metal Gear game playing as a bunch of random soldiers. Sure, this is a bit of a personal preference, I guess, but the recruited enemies can not only have various extra capabilities, like faster dragging speed, the ability to send items back to the truck, or faster recovery from knockouts, but they can also blend in with the enemies. Essentially, they're invisible to enemies of the same type, so why would you not just use them instead of Snake? Well, the soldiers can and will still get spotted and attacked if and when they're seen by other enemy types than their own. 
For example, a private will be ignored by other privates, but officers, majors, and whatever else will still recognize and attack him. Hell, even other privates could still recognize him if he starts doing something silly like walking slowly. Wait, what? No, you didn't hear that wrong. In this game, you're somehow less conspicuous if you run around like a complete idiot than if you walk slowly and calmly. How the fuck does that make any sense? Oh, I can understand how crawling, forward rolling, and definitely attacking will get you into trouble, but how exactly does walking slowly, like every other soldier in sight, make you look more suspicious than running around as if you were being chased by the entire army? Yeah, I know, you're not technically walking, you're stalking, but this is still pretty damn ridiculous. It's also kind of annoying that even though this game is split up into individual levels and you have to prepare your team before each mission, we don't get any indication whatsoever of what types of enemies we may encounter. It's just so annoying when you enter a mission and find out that your chosen team and or equipment are completely wrong. Considering your so-called sneaking unit isn't the only team you have either, this kind of makes less and less sense the further you get. You see, this game also features a heavy emphasis on team management as you actually have four units to place your combatants in. The sneaking unit, the tech unit, the medical unit, and the spy unit, which is the one that causes the aforementioned nonsense. As you'd suspect, the spy unit is used to gather intel, like the location of special items, vulnerabilities in the enemy's defenses, and better overviews of the various areas. This is all well and good, but shouldn't these spies also be able to tell you exactly what sort of enemies are in the various levels? Apparently not, as they don't really tell you anything about the enemy soldiers. Ever! What kind of crap spies are these assholes? Yeah, it's nice to know that a hospital has medicine, I mean, I'd never be able to figure that out for myself, but you know, I think it'd be a bit more useful to know what sort of resistance I can expect. Seriously, who trained these idiots? The other units aren't that much better. Oh, they have their uses, but only the sneaking units actually take part in battle, and only one of those are actually utilized most of the time. The remaining troops are all organized and managed in between missions, which I guess is fair enough, but you just end up spending so much time fiddling about in the damn menus. Honestly, it's such a chore. It's not like you can just place your troops willy-nilly either. Each soldier has different capabilities and stats, making some better suited for combat, while others make better medics or engineers. As such, you do have to think a bit about where your various teammates will do the most good, and you may very well have to swap them around quite a few times over the course of the game. You also have to manage your equipment in between missions. As each soldier can only equip a maximum of four items at a time, you constantly have to think about what their ideal loadout would be, and that can easily change from one mission to the next. You can't pick up anything new unless you have an empty slot either, so going in fully loaded is not always the best option. As this is more of a mission-based game than usual, this isn't necessarily that much of a problem, except when the mission ends with a boss fight. Seriously, there are few things more frustrating than equipping your team with only handguns and or knives just to be ambushed by a battle where a machine gun is all but your only option. On top of all of that, this game doesn't even do stealth right. Sure, you can and kinda have to be a bit sneaky at times, but especially once you start filling up your ranks, the best strategy is just to capture all of the enemies first, as most of them won't recognize you anyway, and then complete your objective without any resistance whatsoever. It honestly gets pretty damn ridiculous. I mean, when you barely play as the main character and there's little to no stealth involved, I don't know if you can really call it a Metal Gear game anymore. Hell, even the Acid games had more stealth, and they were just some dreadful spin-offs. What the hell is this game's excuse? Let's just continue the story for now, though. After getting briefed on the situation by Paramedic and Sigint, Snake returns to free Roy and talks him into joining him as his truck driver. Realizing that they need more intel before doing much else, Snake starts eavesdropping on the enemy guards, eventually leading him to some secret documents detailing part of the Rebels' plans. In a shocking turn of events, it seems the weapon the Fox unit stole is some kind of nuke, and it looks like they're planning a launch on Russia quite soon. Not knowing if this is a bluff or not, Snake and Roy decide to err on the side of caution and act as though this threat is genuine. As such, they need some new recruits, which certainly isn't as complicated as the game makes it seem. You see, one of the first missions is basically a tutorial on how to capture enemies. As part of this, you're told that you need to pick your target carefully, which is complete and utter bull dookie. Really, they claim that you need to find a disgruntled guard, but it makes absolutely no difference. Whomever you pick will become Jonathan anyway, so this is pretty much just a flat out lie. Either way, once he's captured, Jonathan reveals that the soldiers on this peninsula didn't join the Renegade Fox unit and their leader Gene out of fear or brainwashing. They did it because the Russian government betrayed them. In order to avoid serious issues with the US, they erased any trace of this place and cut off communication and supplies for the soldiers stationed here. They sought to isolate the peninsula and make it look like this was all the work of a few out-of-control soldiers. We were abandoned by our own country. Gene told us he would build us a nation. 
A nation not of soldiers, but for them. A nation not of soldiers, but for them. Now, why does that sound so familiar? Oh yeah, it's Trump's latest plan, isn't it? I'm gonna build a nation not of soldiers, but for them. It's gonna be a great nation, it's gonna be huge. You're gonna love it, believe me, because I build the best nations. Nobody builds nations like me. Actually, the reason this all sounds so familiar is because it's pretty much the same concept Big Boss would later use when he sets up Outer Heaven, albeit with a slightly altered philosophy and mentality. In fact, even the name Outer Heaven is apparently derived from Gene's idea, as he actually calls this concept Army's Heaven. In other words, Big Boss is just a big old copycat. In any case, Snake and Roy still manage to convince Jonathan to join them by confirming that Gene seemingly plans to nuke Russia. Before they can do much else though, it seems Roy has come down with what looks like malaria. This leads to a fairly pointless and drawn out section very obviously put in just to pad out the game. You see, instead of immediately trying to procure some medicine for Roy at the nearby hospital that Jonathan eventually reveals he does know the location of, the team first heads to the communication tower, only to be told that they need to go to the hospital anyway. Considering Roy is fucking dying, I really don't think you should be wasting your time on something this damn pointless. Okay, so it turns out that the hospital doesn't actually have the medicine Roy needs after all, but that doesn't make going to the communication tower first a better idea. Either way, the team does find a supply log indicating that the drugs were sent to a research lab, so that's where they head next. This all leads up to a bit of an introduction to Jean, Ursula, and their psychic powers. Ah, so that's why we had to go through all of this bullshit, so you could introduce the villains and their powers. You do know you could have done that a bit more smoothly, right? I mean, I understand that you need to introduce the villains at some point, but you really, really didn't need to stretch out the game to make that happen. It's also a little coincidental that the villains just happens to be in the same location as our heroes at exactly the right time, so all in all, this just comes across as a bit convoluted and unnecessary. It's just not handled all that well. We do still get to see some of what our villains are capable of though. While looking for the malaria drugs, Snake spots Cunningham, Jean and a female lieutenant named Ursula discussing the status of something or someone called Null with what looks like a scientist. Before they say much of value though, yes, Ursula and Jean apparently sense something and warn Cunningham not to move. Before he can properly respond, some nearby scaffolding suddenly collapses and nearly crushes Cunningham. While he, Jean and Ursula are okay, a soldier does get injured and several others are somewhat rattled. That doesn't last long though, as Jean apparently has another trick up his sleeve, or should I say in his throat. We will end an era that sees soldiers discarded like tools and strike war from the menu of global politics. And it is you, soldiers, military engineers, who are her first citizens. Our nation's riches and its fighting spirit. I only pray that such priceless resources do not be sacrificed in vain. Well, I certainly didn't see this coming. Honestly, I had no idea that Jean was actually the supreme being. No, unfortunately, that's not what's going on. Jean just happens to have a few superpowers, one of which is a voice that can manipulate and control people's minds. Weirdly though, he's seemingly never able to alter Snake's mind, as the only time he even comes close is during their final confrontation. I guess Snake just has an exceptionally strong mind or something, I don't know. After this demonstration, Snake is still no closer to finding the malaria drugs though. Roy suggests checking out the culture tank that supposedly holds Null, as he believes they might be storing the drugs in the same place. After Snake finds this tank, it turns out that Null is indeed a person, but not exactly your average person, as is explained to him by a strangely familiar looking young woman. You see, shortly after Snake enters this room, a female medic suddenly walks in on him. She appears to be an ally though, as she helps Snake hide when a couple of soldiers come to search the premises. Snake does find her helpful attitude quite strange though, as he's convinced he just saw her with Jean. That was my sister. Sister? Her name is Ursula. She's the one who's a member of Fox. I'm just a medic. My powers are pretty weak, but Ursula is different. She's one of the most powerful psychics in all the communist world. Through special training, Ursula gained great power but in doing so lost everything that makes her human. So much so that she can't even talk with me anymore. Yeah, apparently this girl named Elisa is the good counterpart to the more evil and powerful Ursula. She also tells Snake that Null, the perfect soldier, was apparently raised under very special conditions to be the ultimate combatant. He has no emotions or will other than to complete his mission, nor does he have any memories. No memories? Each time he completes a mission, he undergoes readjustment, like this. Inside the culture tank, all five senses are shut out completely. 
most men would go mad in minutes. Like a baby who's coming into the world for the first time, the perfect soldier's sensors are honed to a razor sharpness. He can read the enemy's movements and learn them faster than any normal person ever could. What kind of person could endure that kind of extreme training? I don't know, maybe the kind of person who'd be able to come back from the dead as a cyborg ninja? Minus 10 points if you don't get that reference. Anyway, after warning Snake about fighting this Null as she doesn't believe he could win, Elisa gives Snake the drugs he's after and shows him a safe way out of the lab. She tells him to head to the harbor as he'll apparently find what he's looking for there. After healing Roy and going through some rather convoluted, time-consuming and relatively superfluous missions, Snake eventually finds his way to the harbor. Once there, he finds a Soviet colonel being confronted by a kinda creepy soldier with some fairly unique capabilities. Ah! Ah! What are you? You're a monster! You try to kill a man? And call him monster? Such crude behavior. Damn it! Ah! Ah! My arm! This pinhead looking weirdo is actually called Python, and it seems Snake already knows him. Yeah, these two apparently served together during the Vietnam War, but after Python disappeared during a secret mission, Snake believed he had died. While Python obviously survived, he did suffer a severe injury that somehow resulted in his body not being able to regulate its temperature. After the CIA recovered his body, Python was put through rigorous surgery and fitted with a specially designed suit filled with liquid nitrogen, which is how he gained his ability to freeze objects. So in essence, this guy's pretty much just a ripoff of Mr. Freeze. I mean, apart from the whole dying wife thing and the fact that they look a bit different, yeah, it's pretty much the same guy. Let's just hope he's not voiced by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Cool party. Well, actually, Python was supposedly given these treatments in order to make him the anti-snake. Basically, the CIA saw Python as the only man capable of taking down Snake if he ever went against them. In order to keep his skills honed, they also sent Python on loads of assassination missions, which are now causing him nightmares, which in turn fuel his desire to eliminate Snake. This is jumping ahead a little though, as Snake and Python don't actually interact yet. Instead, Python just locks this colonel named Skoronsky inside a cage and leaves him alone with Snake. Unfortunately, Skoronsky doesn't really provide much valuable intel, although he does reveal that he's a fighter pilot, and he also hints that Gene's new weapon is something truly terrifying. Continuing his search, Snake eventually finds what look to be containers for Gene's prototype weapon, but unfortunately, they're all empty. They do contain some spare parts though, all of which seem to indicate that this weapon is some sort of tank. Having assumed that this prototype was some sort of ICBM, Roy and Snake find this rather confusing, but then they're contacted by a ghost. Uh, excuse me, I think you made a mistake here, Mr. Ghost. You were supposed to show up last time and do some babbling or something. You're not on the roster for this one. No, this obviously isn't an actual ghost, but rather some unknown person using that as a moniker. He was apparently involved in the events of MGS3, or at least he knows about them, as he thanks Snake for taking care of Volgen. He also reminds Snake of the Shagohard, as he continues by explaining that Gene's new weapon is basically the next evolution of that sort of beast. As if you didn't already know, this new weapon is of course a new Metal Gear, or rather, the first Metal Gear. Yeah, in the canonical storyline of the games, this prototype is in fact the very first machine to carry the Metal Gear moniker, named as it is Metal Gear Rasha. Ghost proceeds to explain that this Metal Gear is a walking tank intended to be launched via a rocket into enemy territory, where it would then launch a so-called MERV. Basically, this MERV is a missile with multiple nuclear warheads, meaning this Metal Gear is capable of obliterating several targets at once without any support whatsoever. Once they've learned all of this, Snake and his team decide their next course of action should be to locate the enemy's nuclear stockpile and render it unusable before Metal Gear can be armed. After eventually finding the nuclear storage facility, Snake is about to blow the machine room to smithereens when Python suddenly stops him, which apparently may have saved his life. You should be more careful. Snake, with the way you planted that bomb, the blast would have been far too powerful. You would have ended up cutting off your own escape route. You're so focused on completing the mission that you neglected your own personal safety. Nasty habits are hard to kick, eh, Snake? Whoa, 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 hang on a second. Are you seriously telling me that Snake not only made a potentially fatal mistake with these explosives, but that he apparently does that all the time? Yeah, that's not a bad habit, that's failed suicide bombing! Python then fills Snake in on his previously mentioned backstory and begins to attack him. As I explained earlier, this and pretty much all following boss battles can be rather tricky, but it's certainly not impossible. 
There is a bit of an extra reward for taking him down non-lethally, but I certainly don't think it's worth the hassle. Basically, Python will join your team if you don't kill him. Now, I never bothered with this, so I don't know for certain, but based on what I've seen and heard, this guy's certainly not worth the trouble. I mean, he doesn't have any camouflage or anything else all that helpful, so he'll most likely just sit by the sidelines most of the time anyway. Python isn't the only fully fledged character you have the option of recruiting though. You can actually recruit several of the more established characters from both this and previous titles, but doing so is usually quite a convoluted and relatively random process. Python is the only one you recruit by non-lethal takedown, the rest all involve various incomprehensible methods. I honestly couldn't tell you exactly what these methods actually are though, as I simply don't give a toss. After all, it doesn't really matter, as none of these guys are as useful as all the random soldiers you'll have tons of anyway. I just don't see the point in wasting your time trying to get Rydenovich or whoever, when they're not going to provide you with any sort of advantage whatsoever. Anyway, Snake eventually defeats Python, but it seems the nuclear warheads have already been moved. After a few more runarounds, the team eventually learn that the warheads and Metal Gear have been moved to an underground facility. After heading to a silo to find a secret entrance to this facility, Snake is suddenly ambushed by Null, who's not quite as perfect as first indicated. Oh, he most likely will get a few hits on you, but his tactics aren't exactly all that clever, and as long as you have some rations, a few extra soldiers, and or some decent equipment, he's kind of a pushover. Just keep up pressure on him, use heavy weapons and or shoot him in his back when possible, and he'll go down much sooner than you think. Perfect soldier my ass. Not only does he require a huge amount of sleep and readjustment after every fucking mission, but he's not even able to take on some random soldier without getting shot in the back or hit in the face with an RPG. He's even more useless than Beetle Bloody Bailey. Sorry, fellas. Either way, Snake obviously withstands Null's attacks, but before he can get away from him completely, Cunningham and some guards suddenly surround them, knock out Snake and take him into custody. This doesn't really have much of an effect on things though, at least not for me, as Snake wasn't exactly the most important combatant anyway. Still, you do need to get him back, so Roy and the rest of the team search his last known location and interrogate enemies for clues to his whereabouts. They eventually find out that he's being held in a place called the Guest House, but as this is apparently a highly secure and secretive facility, it'll take them some time, or rather a few missions, to narrow down his exact location. In the meantime, Snake is being interrogated by Cunningham, who still believes Snake has the missing half of the Philosopher's Legacy. Gene is less than certain that Cunningham's methods are all that effective though, and he's even more reluctant to allow him to use a truth serum like he wants. He does eventually agree though, but only if he can have a private little chat with Snake first. Once Cunningham leaves, Gene reveals to Snake that the theft of Metal Gear was actually a setup by the CIA, who planned on giving this weapon to the Russians. Why? To prolong the Cold War and maintain their importance and the current balance of power. Fox's orders from the CIA were not to guard Metal Gear during transport, but to steal it. And then to pretend to defect to the Soviet Union. A clever plan on the part of the CIA all designed to protect its organizational interests. Yep, the CIA are nothing but a bunch of self-serving, shady, immoral, and just downright despicable monsters. I mean, they're almost as bad as FIFA, the organization. And the game, they're equally evil. Jean also tells Snake about a secret experiment conducted by the US called the Successor Project. The goal of this experiment was to create the ultimate battlefield commander, imbued with various special traits, skills, and powers, the result of which was, you guessed it, Gene himself. It's not really explained how this was all done, but I guess we're just not supposed to think about that. In any case, Jean then leaves as Elisa eventually shows up and tricks the guard into believing she's there to give Snake some food and a little, uh, extra treat. While the guard is turned away though, Elisa actually uses her telepathic powers to inform Snake that Jean has already begun prepping Metal Gear for launch and that it has been moved to the assembly plant. Unfortunately, Elisa is unable to provide Snake with any more assistance for now, but as luck would have it, his teammates show up to save him shortly thereafter. As they're making their way out though, they're suddenly confronted by Cunningham and his flying platform. Still trying to get his hands on the legacy half he's apparently been convinced by the Pentagon Snake has in his possession, Cunningham begins shooting Snake's men and says he won't stop until Snake gives him what he wants. Snake tries in vain to stop him, but thankfully Roy and Elisa suddenly turn up in a truck, knock Cunningham over and get Snake and his men to safety. While leading the team to Metal Gear's location, Elisa explains that she's betraying Jean to prevent a nuclear war and she believes Snake is the only one who can actually stop him. She apparently had a vision of Snake destroying Metal Gear, although her sister Ursula saw him plunging the world into fear. This is the first time their visions differed, or at least that's what Elisa thinks for now. You might already know where I'm going with that, but for now, Snake and his team head to the plant to blow up Metal Gear. 
Gene is apparently right behind them though, as he and his men catch up to them right as they're about to plant their explosives. As the team is about to be apprehended though, Metal Gear suddenly starts up and shoots some of Gene's men. It seems Goronsky has somehow eluded everybody and made his way into Metal Gear's cockpit. Unfortunately, Metal Gear isn't quite complete, so he doesn't actually manage to do that much damage, especially not to Gene. He does make it possible for Snake to sneak up on Gene while he's distracted though, but it seems Gene was prepared even for this eventuality. Allow me to share with you my true trump card. What? Wake up, Ursula. Snake, shoot me. Elisa, what are you talking about? Shoot now! If you don't, I'll... I'll... Ah! I'll kill you, Snake. Kill you before you spawn your accursed snake children. <clears throat> wow, that is one bad mood swing. Seriously, this has to be the worst case of PMS I have ever seen. Well, actually, this turns out to be Ursula, who's not really Elisa's sister, she's her split personality. Basically, Ursula is a more powerful, dangerous, and ruthless version of Elisa, and unfortunately for him, she's decided Snake needs to die. As such, she lowers herself into Metal Gear and starts controlling it using her powers, which apparently augments this machine's capabilities somehow. You don't really notice this augmentation all that much in the ensuing battle though, as it's actually pretty pathetic, especially for a Metal Gear fight. Basically, there are two stages to this fight, as you first have to take out Metal Gear's legs. While you do have to avoid various projectiles as well as the machine itself crushing you after it's been hovering, this is a pretty easy task to complete. When the legs are destroyed, Metal Gear will basically hunch over as you have to shoot the missile launch ports when they're exposed. In essence, this involves circling around waiting for them to open while avoiding the inevitable missiles and potential machine gun fire. It's honestly not that difficult, though it can be relatively time consuming depending on your loadout. Once Metal Gear blows up and Elisa seemingly dies, Gene's plans appear to have failed, but no. He actually has yet another ace up his sleeve as the mysterious ghost suddenly enters, revealing himself to be Sokolov, the scientist who developed the Shagohard. He informs Snake that Rasha was just a test model, and Gene confirms that there is indeed another Metal Gear. As if that's not bad enough, Gene then uses his mind-altering voice to fill every soldier in the plant with extreme fear and paranoia, as he makes them think there's a secret agent with them waiting to shoot them. Before you know it, everyone is firing at each other, as even Jonathan gets killed. No, not Jonathan, anyone but him! I mean, I only have about a thousand other guys exactly like him, and I really only know his first name, but we've just shared so much! Please, don't take away my dear, dear... Uh... Uh... I want to say Gordon? Okay, so it is a bit sad to see this guy sacrifice himself and all, but he is pretty much just another soldier, and yet they treat this like he was an integral character or something. Really, Snake even lets out a full-on scream of anguish. <laughs> Anyway, Gene then gets on a helicopter as Snake and his crew are left to find a way into the underground complex holding the real Metal Gear. This apparently requires blowing up a nearby power station first, but they can't just use regular explosives. You see, there's an auxiliary power system that will kick in after 5 minutes, meaning this requires a detonation timer. After even more fucking padding, Snake eventually places some timed explosives on the substation switchboard, after which he's once again confronted by Null. It seems Null has been unable to readjust after their last encounter, as Snake is still alive. Null's targets are supposed to die, so the fact that Snake survived apparently managed to completely break Null's programming. It also turns out that these two actually have a bit of a history. Snake apparently recognizes Null's techniques, which are apparently so unique that they could only belong to one person. It was four years ago, in Mozambique. There was a child soldier fighting with a guerrilla group in the struggle for independence. He killed dozens of government soldiers with just a single knife. He'd throw the enemy off guard with the innocent frankness of a young boy. Then he'd prey on them with the cold cruelty of a hunter. He spoke a little German, so his enemies called him Frank Jaeger. Yep, Null is none other than Frank Jaeger, the man who would later be known as Grey Fox. This is a decent enough revelation and all, but my fuck is that story stupid and cringy. I mean, come on, you're seriously telling me that Frank Jaeger isn't actually a name, it's just a description of this guy's battle techniques? How crap is that? They really couldn't come up with a better nickname? Even something as dumb as Kid Kill would be better, and that's just off the top of my idiotic little brain. What's these guys' excuse? I guess this doesn't matter too much though, and it's not like hearing his old call sign has much of an effect on Null anyway. Oh, he hesitates for a brief moment, but he's still determined to take Snake down, meaning we now have to have another fight with him. I don't really need to say anything else though, as this fight is pretty much identical to the last one. After he's defeated, Null apparently regains his memories of Big Boss and how he saved him from the battlefield as a child. 
Unfortunately, he was then recruited and experimented on by what Snake presumes must have been the Philosophers. Null is still grateful to Snake though, and as such he ends up joining Snake's team. If you play the game a second time, which I don't see any reason for doing. In any case, the team heads back to the silo entrance as the time bomb goes off. This apparently opens the underground complex gate for 5 minutes, meaning you'll now have to ignore everything else and haul ass. Really, you actually only get 5 minutes to reach the complex entrance, and if you die and or take too long, you'll have to start all over again by planting yet another bomb. Once inside the underground complex, Snake makes his way through some sort of labyrinthian storage area and eventually reaches a freight elevator. Unfortunately, he is then suddenly confronted by Cunningham again, but this time he doesn't want to fight, as he actually has a bit of a surprise for Snake. It turns out that Cunningham is actually working for the Pentagon, not Gene or the CIA. He claims everything Snake has been doing was a result of a convoluted plan thought up by the Pentagon to diminish the CIA's influence over the military. They basically hired Gene to steal Metal Gear and provoked him to launch an attack on Russia. Now, while it may seem that this would do nothing but start a nuclear war, Cunningham points out that as Gene is a renegade and this base as well as the fundamental designs for Metal Gear are Russian made, the US would be safe from any repercussions. As for anyone on this base revealing the truth, there's a plan to prevent that as well. See this snake? A Davy Crockett. Exactly. A miniature nuclear warhead. But this one is Soviet made. After Gene launches Metal Gear, I'll obliterate this base. Not a single blade of grass will be left behind. It even seems the Pentagon arranged for Snake's appearance on the peninsula, as they anticipated that he would attempt to take Gene down, which in their view would force him to launch Metal Gear. While this has all gone according to plan so far, they still need this launch to happen, so Cunningham offers Snake a lift back to America if he stands down immediately. Which Snake obviously agrees to. He gets on Cunningham's chopper, the base gets blown up, and they both head off into the sunset to live happily ever after. I just love a happy ending. No, of course Snake turns him down, and we have ourselves another boss fight. Cunningham can be a bit annoying, and you can't lose a single life as Snake goes in solo on this one, but all in all, this is a decent enough battle. I do think the elevator makes for a very tight and cumbersome battle arena, especially when Cunningham shoots explosives, but again, it's reasonable enough. Basically, you first have to damage Cunningham's flying platform, which will eventually cause him to drop down below the elevator. At this point you have to attack Cunningham himself, and after going back and forth between these two segments for a while, you'll eventually be victorious. As long as you don't get hit by too many missiles or mines, that is. Once Cunningham literally goes down in flames, Snake makes his way to the launch silo where he runs directly into Gene. Instead of just shooting him right then and there though, Snake instead decides to let Gene explain his plan in full. You know, because he hasn't quite proven his evil intentions yet. As it turns out though, Gene does not plan to launch Metal Gear on Russia after all, but rather the US. More specifically, he plans to obliterate the Philosophers by striking the Pentagon and the CIA headquarters in Langley. This will result in unprecedented global chaos, during which Gene plans to set up his new mercenary nation, which will work from the shadows to write history as they see fit. Gene also claims that everything that happened during Operation Snake Eater, including Volgen launching that David Crockett, was actually a setup by someone in the US. He doesn't go into any more detail than that, and as far as I know and remember, it's never been confirmed who this person was or why this was done, and while there are theories on the former, I have no clue as to the latter. Seriously, why would anyone plan something like that? What possible benefit could there be in nearly causing and then having to prevent a new world war? Are we supposed to believe it was some sort of early test for what would become the Patriots or something? No, I'm really asking you because I honestly have no idea. Either way, Gene then attempts and fails to lure Snake to his side, but as Snake for some bewildering reason still doesn't just shoot this clearly evil prick, Gene has more than enough time to initiate the launch sequence. Or rather, he would if not for the sudden appearance of Ursula. Or is it Elisa? Let's just call her Ursulisa. As she knows the horrible effects of nuclear weapons firsthand, Ursulisa destroys the launch terminal in order to stop Gene's plans. She is also able to deflect Gene's long range attacks so she can read his mind, but unfortunately she is no match for his superior speed and ends up getting stabbed through the chest. Before she dies, Elisa, who it's now clear this really is, tells Snake that Gene could still use a nearby backup terminal to launch Metal Gear and implores him to prevent that from happening. She also uses her final breath to basically predict the entire future of the franchise. The futures we saw were one and the same. Snake, you will destroy Metal Gear. And you will create a new Metal Gear in its place. Your children, les enfants terribles. Snake, your son will bring the world to ruin. Your son will save the world. 
oh, and you will suddenly change your voice, the creator of this world will be completely shafted, and this entire universe will fall into the hands of a bunch of disrespectful and moronic apes. Seriously, fuck Konami. Anyway, this all leads us to the final confrontation of the game, as Snake finally takes on Jean. Fittingly, this is probably one of the tougher battles in the game, but it also feels somewhat unfair and ultimately just annoying. No, it's not terrible, but it just feels unnecessarily frustrating. Basically, Gene will use his powers to either blur your vision and drain your stamina, evade your attacks, and or power up his own attacks by either rapid firing his throwing knives, or basically dash attacking you. This is all possible to avoid and all, but the margins for error are extremely tiny, and the amount of damage Gene can inflict is ridiculous. I'm not kidding, if you get hit more than two or three times, at least by the dash attack, you're done. It's absolutely ludicrous. Couple that with the fact that you'll probably get hit with most of his knife attacks as well, and you just end up feeling more lucky than skilled when and if you win. It's still not an impossible fight though, so you'll more than likely win eventually. Once you do, Gene had Snake a film containing his secret funds, but unfortunately, Metal Gear has already entered launch mode and there is no way to abort. With a bit of help from Sokolov though, Snake figures out that he can still destroy Metal Gear before the rocket holding it takes off. While Snake manages to land what looks to be a perfect hit though, Metal Gear unfortunately remains intact. It seems all hope is lost when suddenly... What are you doing? Those weapons won't do any good! Get out of here before you're caught up in the blast and killed! You risked your life to save our motherland! Now it's our turn to defend your country! You've given us a real reason to fight, big boss! Yeah, okay, so this is a pretty sappy moment and all, but you know what? I still love this scene. Sure, this is rather cheesy, and it's not exactly the most emotional moment in the franchise, not by any stretch, but I still get ever so slightly choked up by this. There's just something pretty emotional about how these guys who started out as his enemies are now willing to fight and die for Snake and his country. I just think it's a rather powerful image, sappy though it may be. Unfortunately, even the combined might of both Snake and all of these soldiers can't stop the Metal Gear rocket from being launched. As it happens though, they did apparently manage to damage Metal Gear enough to make it inoperable, as it fails to deploy properly and is seen plummeting back to Earth. We then get a scene from some underground facility beneath the CIA headquarters. The director is apparently being brought to a fallout shelter, but before he gets very far, he's suddenly greeted by Ocelot. Believing that he's there to help, the director reveals to Ocelot that he's carrying some very important documents pertaining to the philosophers, at which point Ocelot does this. What the hell are you doing? You're not planning to betray the philosophers, are you? Betray? No, I'm not going to betray them. I'm going to end them. Then we'll take back what you stole from us. We will carry on the spirit of the true patriot. And so, I've come for the other half of the legacy. Before we learn anything else about what's going on here though, we instead see that Snake makes it back to the US, where he receives a commendation even though the truth of his mission has apparently been covered up. He also shares a salute with the Soviet soldiers, as the game ends with Snake making or finishing up a most likely rather important phone call. Well actually, as it's kind of a staple of the series at this point, this game also has a bit of a post credit scene. It's not anything all that shocking though, as it basically just involves Ocelot talking to his secret contact within the US government. They seem to be talking about the Les Enfants Terribles project, as their conversation ends with Ocelot requesting that they get Big Boss to join them. Ultimately, this game is just a mess. Sure, the story is decent enough, and I for one like the presentation and art style, but the gameplay is just a drawn out pain, and the game is borderline ruined by the awkward and completely idiotic camera and control system. In addition, most of your time is spent in damn menus, and you play less as Snake than you do some random soldier. If there was ever a game screaming out for a remake, or at the very least an animated or digital graphic novel adaptation, this is the one. There is a pretty intriguing story here, but unfortunately it's tangled up in a rather poor game. If you're so inclined, I'd recommend finding the cutscenes on YouTube or something, as I do recommend the story, but certainly not the game. No matter what though, we still have plenty of other titles to get to, so why don't we head back to- <coughs> What? What do you mean I forgot something? Oh, right. I did forget that, didn't I? <sighs> well, okay, but let's just be quick about this, alright? The thing is that this game, like a few of the other main entries in the series, also had an additional enhanced edition called Portable Ops Plus. Well, I say enhanced, but in reality, this edition of the game is actually the far, far inferior version. Why? 
because it doesn't even include the main portion of the game. It doesn't have the story mode. No, I am so not kidding. They made an enhanced plus version of the game where they actually removed the main reason to buy it in the first place. Sure, they replaced the story mode with some new Infinity Mission malarkey, but this is basically just a standalone version of the online multiplayer mode. How the flying pig shit is that not the Minus Edition? Fine, some people apparently did enjoy the multiplayer portion of this game, and they did include a few tweaks and enhancements here, but... What kind of moron buys a Metal Gear game for the online mode? On the PSP, no less! Yeah, sure, people are entitled to their opinions and all that noise, but honestly, if you actually bought this game on purpose, you are the derpiest of derpy derps. To be fair though, I never did buy this version, so I don't really know that much about its actual quality. Hell, I never really played the online mode in the original version either, so I guess I just don't know what I'm talking about. Then again, neither does anyone who claims that this is worth your money. Metal Gear Single Player is its bread and butter, so without that, you just have baloney. Either way, I've been going on for far too long already, and we do have some rather more important titles to get to. In fact, our next outing might just be a certain someone's absolute final mission. No, I'm not crying. But I definitely will be.